Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to our Build Your Career webinar series. My name is Michelle Fawn. I manage our education and professional expectations, products, and services here at the IEEE Computer Society. Each month, we will be hosting webinars on vital business skills that will help you excel throughout your career. Topics covered include communication and presentation skills, interviewing tips, personal branding, effective writing, tips to improve your outside-the-box thinking, and more. Before we get started, I would like to address some housekeeping tasks. Uh, the recording of this webinar has started. You can ask any question in the Q&A panel. Our speaker, Roger, will answer as many questions as he can following his presentation. In a few days, you will receive an email with instructions to access both the presentation slides and the recording um, on demand. Today's webinar is uh, on what's the story, influence through storytelling. Stories are the most effective form of human communication. What part of the presentation do listeners remember most? Stories. In this engaging and energizing presentation, you'll learn the secrets to telling great stories and how to incorporate them into your job, whether presenting to the board, employees, colleagues, or customers. Joining us today is Roger Granis, principal of Granis Group since 2005. Roger understands engineers and has dedicated his career to helping them communicate more effectively. He has also improved business performance at some of the biggest names in a business such as GE, Underwriter Laboratories, Semantics, Pepsi, Rural Bank of Scotland, Foot Locker, and Synchronous. Uh, Roger, thank you again for presenting. The floor is yours. Roger? Good morning, everybody. Got to undo that mute button. <laughs> Lesson one in public speaking. So welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us on this really fun and important topic on storytelling. As Michelle said, storytelling is the single most effective form of human communication. And we technical people, we engineers, maybe don't think of telling stories as the first thing when we're putting together a presentation. And I just want to say that uh, open your minds. Uh, story, <clears throat> excuse me, stories are everywhere, and we're going to uh, begin and, and look at how to how to use them on the job. Here we go. So I'm going to begin, and you'll notice I'm beginning with a story, and I'll I'll deconstruct this introduction uh, once I'm done. But I grew up in the, the San Francisco Bay Area. Some of you may know the Golden Gate Bridge. Maybe you've walked across it. And my father uh, was a lot like you. He is, uh, was an engineer. He went to UC Berkeley. Uh, he was uh, an electrical engineer. And uh, he was always in the basement uh, inventing things that went up on poles used for electricity. So he would make and sell hardware to companies like Pacific Gas and Electric. And this picture is uh, the last day I lived in California when I got home from that lunch on his birthday. I got a message from Gartner back east in Connecticut across the United States saying, hey, we'd like to hire you. Can you start Monday? And so that lunch took on a lot more significance than we knew at the time. Uh, we would uh, take vacations in California to, to beautiful places like Yosemite and Carmel and Monterey, and my dad would pull the station wagon over and uh, take pictures of telephone poles. So we would not come back, back with pictures of the ocean and uh, Yosemite and, and Half Dome. He would come back with a whole couple of rolls of film full of uh, pictures like this because that was his love. That was his passion. Um, I have a creative streak. I'm not an engineer, but I certainly understand engineers having grown up around my father and others, as you'll see. Uh, I wanted to pursue the arts, and I was a disc jockey for a while. I did some theater and tried my hand at stand-up comedy. My mom is uh, pretty straightforward and said, uh, you know, son, uh, that's not the career path we'd like you to go down. So I, I caved. I, I gave in, and I said, okay, fine. Uh, my mom said, you'd be great in sales. So I went into sales, and here I was, an unemployed actor in San Francisco, and got hired by Adam Osborne. This is where we begin connecting to uh, technology, computers. And so back in the early 80s, I worked for Adam Osborne. He was the inventor of the first portable computer. It weighed 22 pounds. 
he actually had a publishing company before he started a computer company in Berkeley, and he used the proceeds from that company to start the, uh, the, the computer company. But Osborne Books Publishing Company, uh, later sold to McGraw-Hill Publishing, had user guides to make complex concepts simple. So we had the Apple II user's guide, uh, CPM, we had a 6502 assembly language programming. So technical manuals designed to help engineers, computer folks, understand and use the technology or what have you. Um, what I did notice there, when it came time to the authors of the books to explain the content uh, and so that we could go out and sell them, we needed to know the product so we could go pitch them to bookstores, computer stores, and whatnot. Uh, they would speak a half an hour each and go to, into lots and lots and lots of detail. It was much more information than we needed. Then I moved to Connecticut across the United States, about an hour from New York City, and I worked for 17 years at Gartner. And as, as you may know, Gartner, they are technology research advisors, and now they hit through acquisition, are advising people in other areas, sales, marketing, business, what have you. But at the time, it was focused just on technology. And maybe you've heard of this company. Uh, it's, it's fairly well known in the tech space. And I noticed the same thing in the product training. It was three days of these technical people going into vast detail on their services and how they help clients. So I experienced, as with my fellow salespeople, information overload and death by details. It was a real problem. So I actually spoke up and said, hey, you know, this, this training isn't very good. And they said, okay, smart guy, you think you know how to do it? Why don't you start Gartner Sales University? And so I actually was able to bring in my creativity from the theater and creative writing space uh, that I played in for a while. And I did some sales training at night. It was teaching sales training uh, in San Francisco when I worked for Osborne. So I was able to start Gartner Sales University. And then, uh, again, now here's, here's where we get into what we're talking about today. We, we, I realized how important not only is it to simplify information, but one of the best ways to make your message stick is to include stories. So I was teaching the Gartner technical experts, how to tell stories and use those stories to teach salespeople so that we would understand the key concepts and then be able to go out and have good conversations with our prospects and clients. And then later I started the podcast, uh, Talking Technology. I produced that and hosted that for nine years. Uh, again, using the the, I would teach the, the people, our guests, the, the Gartner technical experts, how to simplify their content and how to use stories. So that's, that's the root, that's the, that's the genesis of how I became so passionate about uh, helping engineers. I actually grew up, I was kind of shy and uh, introverted. Uh, so between my understanding my father and knowing that, hey, you know, most engineers are – uh, you know, we enjoy our tinkering, and we're not really uh, – we, we're probably more on the introverted side. So I had to overcome that. So I have tremendous empathy for uh, engineers and others and, and love helping you all uh, be more effective communicators. And so we're going to look today at, at that one aspect of being more effective communicators. We've had other sessions. I think you can watch the recordings. Uh, on presentation skills, uh, influence, how to be more effective communicators. Today, we're going to focus just on storytelling because it's so important. Uh, and we use, of course, in, the, in what I do now, Granis Group, we teach presentation, influence, per, uh, communication skills, and, and certainly storytelling is part of that. Uh, at the end, I am going to offer a couple of freebies, so stick around uh, if you'd like. All right, so... Let's take a look at what I just did. Once Michelle turned the call over to me, and I turned off the mute button, uh, I want to show you how I used stories 
in the introduction. So we're going to kind of reverse engineer how this, how this came about. So here are the first three slides. I started with the, a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. And, and, you know, back when mom and dad would, your aunts, uncles, grandmas, would read you stories, a lot of them started out once upon a time. So when telling stories, we want to begin with a time and a place and the characters. Okay, that's why I deliberately said I grew up in San Francisco. When, when you hear San Francisco, eh, a lot of people, uh, especially who uh, some of you may live there, uh, but those who haven't uh, may have visited or seen pictures. So it, it creates a response. Uh, it creates a feeling. Uh, oh, <clears throat> San Francisco, the cable cars, the Golden Gate Bridge, the Bay, Fisherman's Wharf. So you're now mentally transported to the place. Then I wanted to uh, let you know that I, <clears throat> I'm a lot like you. I understand you. And so I said, all right, how can I do that? Well, gosh, my dad's an engineer. Let's mention a story about my father, how he was an engineer, inventing things down in the basement. Again, now you're thinking, oh, yeah, I'm kind of like that. I do a lot of inventing. I like tinkering. I like creating things. Uh, there's also an emotional connection, perhaps good or bad, with your own father. Uh, my father was a great guy, so I have a positive feeling about my dad. But now we're talking about family. So, again, that's an emotional response. So that's so time and a place, uh, emotional response. My father's a lot like you. Uh, I still telling the story about the telephone poles. Uh, it's kind of a quirky, funny, it's not laugh out loud, but it's like, oh, this guy's kind of a nerd. Hey, I'm kind of a nerd. So now we're creatively creating a connection. Right, hey, Roger's a guy just like me. He's got a father. Oh, engineer, telephone poles. Oh, gosh. You may be even thinking about a funny thing you do, like, uh, I don't know what you do. Maybe you take pictures of... Maybe you take computers apart and look at the components. Uh, whatever it is, uh, the story is creating it in your own head. Okay, I mentioned that I have a, I pursued my dream of radio and theater and stand-up comedy. And, you know, frankly, the dream was crushed uh, by my mother. She, she absolutely derailed it. So this uh, humanizes me. Uh, oh, here's a guy just like me. Uh, not everything went his way in life. I can relate to him. Even though Rogers had some success, hey, he, he, he's, he stumbled. Uh, his dream was crushed. You know, so now you may be feeling some empathy. But also I wanted to mention that background because I was able to use it later in helping the Gartner technical people be more effective speakers and developing sales training. All right, then we, now we're – so that was sort of the, the bottom, uh, you know, the, the, the low point, uh, one of the low points of my life. Uh, but, you know, if you look at storytelling, uh, a person has setbacks, hurdles, and then they overcome the hurdles. That's the hero's journey in storytelling. So, you know, think of any movie, uh, the Mighty Ducks hockey team. You know, they were uh, – they, they weren't going to win. They were the underdogs, and they overcame challenge one. They overcame challenge two. We want to root for the hero. Uh, so by showing you, hey, and not everything went my way, uh, and maybe you want to start rooting for me or see what happened. So fortunately, I got a great job. I can't believe it, going from unemployed actor to working for in the computer industry at the dawn of the personal computing revolution. Whoa, how'd that happen? Well, I told Adam Osborne I was in radio and I had to think quick and speak on the phone because we were doing a lot of sales by phone. So this builds my credibility a little bit. Um, and then we, now we're tying this back to you, I discovered a problem. The authors of the books and the Gartner technical experts talked too much, too much detail. And I know, frankly, that's a common problem with engineers. We, we give too much detail. So then I summarized the problem. Uh, you know, I let you know that I did start Garden University. Michelle mentioned that, too. Uh, we should not be heroes of our own story. But, uh, you know, 
I, I started Gartner Sales University, so there are a lot of lessons I learned that I can pass along to you. So maybe you're thinking, all right, maybe Roger can help me, and then I wanted you to pay attention, so I mentioned the freebies at the end. So that's kind of a, a look behind the curtain as to why I, I started this presentation that way. And, and there are many lessons in there, so if we stop right now, you'd probably have enough to go on. But let's take it a little bit further. Let's dig deeper into stories. Our agenda is three parts. Why? Why stories? What stories to tell? And how do we do it effectively? And you'll notice from presentation standpoint, it's three bullets. One, two, three. Uh, if you've listened to my presentation skills presentation, uh, there's power in consolidating your points into three. One, two, three. There's something magic about three things. Why stories? Well, it's the oldest form of human communication. We started out in the caves drawing pictures on walls. Uh, there have been studies done where people get wired, uh, you know, wires stuck uh, on their head, on their brain to do brain scans. And uh, when people are hearing stories, more parts of the brain light up than any other time. So we're wired to tell stories. We're wired to hear stories. We love storytelling, unless somebody's talking too long and too boring, and you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, but stories make us human and relatable. They touch the emotions. People are, you know, we want to think every decision we make is based on logic. Well, that's not true. Emotion plays a role. There's, a, there's an old saying in the sales world, people buy with, an, with emotion and justify their decisions with logic. And that's just not a sales principle, but it's a, it's a, it's a principle. Think about when you, you bought a house or rented an apartment or bought a car. Boy, you, get, you fall in love with something, and then maybe you rationalize part of the house or the apartment or the car that eh, wasn't quite what you wanted, but you were in love. So it, that, that emotional part uh, is, is definitely part of decision-making. Uh, Telling stories provides variety if you're presenting. Rather than just giving facts and data, they give us a mental break. Remember, people, more parts of our brain light up when we're listening to stories, so gosh, why not intersperse those in your presentations? Uh, they're also memorable. If you ask, okay, here's an example. Um, I'm in a men's group. We meet Saturday mornings. Uh, randomly, about six months ago, uh, we, we each share you know, something from our, our lives based on the topic of the day. And I, something, a memory from my childhood popped into mind, and it was a time my mom brought a, a woman home from the grocery store who was down on her luck, and together uh, they made a yellow cake. It was a yellow cake. And now, with all my, my buddies from this men's group, I'm, Roger is the yellow cake guy. In fact, just before this call, literally a half an hour ago, Peter Ferfaro, one of my one of my pals, sent me an email saying, "Hey, here's a recipe. I'll bet it's not a, a, a yellow cake recipe." And he copied all my buddies. He said, "I'll bet it's not as good as Roger's mother's recipe." So, you know, that was a, a story I told, and that, and it and it they they have not forgot it. Okay, uh, other things, uh, stories uh, engage the audience. They help bring ideas to life. They're a great way to embed a key message or key lesson rather than just telling it straight out. It's, it's just a more indirect, subtle way to make a point rather than just say, hey, you've got to take out the garbage. Maybe you tell a story about the time you took out the garbage or forgot to take out the garbage and how the bears broke into your garage. So you're telling your child, hey, take out the garbage or you're grounded. No, rather say, hey, let me tell you a story about a time I didn't take the garbage out and what happened. So it's a great way to, to persuade uh, a little bit more indirectly. And when we're listening to stories, we are wired as humans to want to hear how the story ends. Now, I know there are uh, exceptions to that, uh, uh, maybe in your circle of friends. I certainly have mine who people tell the same story over and over, and it's, you know, it's boring. Let's be honest, it's boring. <laughs> so, but in general, we are wired to listen to the end. Here's another example. Uh, I was talking to, I'm a, 
I'm the president of our local uh, chapter, the New England chapter of the National Speakers Association, and we needed to book a speaker for this Saturday on, um, on PowerPoint presentations, just PowerPoint mechanics. And we had a, our head of uh, programming, had a speaker lined up, and, uh, but wasn't confirming. He was having a baby. There were some complications. And so I said to the programming chair, hey, uh, I think we better get somebody else lined up. And then he said, well, hold on a second. Um, we could do that. But let me tell you a story about when I was in high school, and I asked Barbara to go to the prom, and she said yes. And then I kept calling to get confirmation. She never did. So I asked Susan to go to the prom. She said, oh, I'd love to go to the prom. And then the day before the prom, Barbara called and said, hey, what time are you picking me up? So rather than Matt, our programming chair, saying, Roger, we're not going to book a second speaker, he's, he told me the story of the time he was in the exact same situation and how booking the second girl uh, created a, a, a really awkward situation for him. Uh, and the final reason is there are some statistics floating out there. I haven't dug deep. I think this, there's some validity to this, but there is a statistic saying stories are 22% more likely to be remembered than simple facts. So there's some, some data behind this. All right, so those are all the reasons to, to tell stories. And feel free to type any questions in the chat or comments. Uh, we want this to be high value for you. Let's look at five story types. Connect, so how to connect with people, to illustrate a point, to influence or persuade, uh, to demonstrate improvement, to, to tell how you've been successful, and then finally uh, a story to inspire. All right, so the connection story we heard already when I talked at the beginning about my dad being an engineer, the telephone poles. So my objectives, talking to you today at the beginning, were to I wanted you to relate to me. So I wanted to be relatable to you. I wanted to show you we have something in common. And the reason that is uh, people like people who are like them. So uh, showing some commonality helps you be more likable and relatable to the audience. Uh, and then, and I just want to say this, this has all got to be genuine and authentic and not fake. I've had people look me up on LinkedIn and, and say, hey, I see you rode your bike across the United States. Well, I did this and that. It, it, it's almost like it's, they've used a technique on me, uh, and it, it, you know, it feels manipulative. So make sure it's genuine and sincere and authentic. So relatable, something in common, and I wanted to bring in a little, little humor. Again, not funny out loud, but uh, there's an old saying, the shortest distance between two people is laughter. So if you can if you get a, a, a warm feeling of humor or even a laugh at the beginning or sometime, uh, that's, that helps. So again, that's partly why the telephone poll story came in. All right, uh, so that's the connection. Where might we use these? Well, at the beginning of a presentation, uh, introducing yourself to a group, uh, maybe you're meeting new people. So uh, another thing we'll talk about later is that uh, w if you really want to connect with people, the most important story is their story. So when you're meeting one-on-one, -on -one, we want to get them talking, getting them sharing their story, their history, opening up a little bit. Uh, and then you can weave in your stories that might relate to, to them, not trying to tell a better story or as we say, one up them. Hey, I've got a better story than that. That's that's not uh, that's not good. Um, if you've got some ideas on where else you might use stories to connect with people, type it in the chat. If not, we will continue on. All right, let's move to our second type of story to illustrate a point. So you, as engineers, probably would do this a lot. So one of the things that I do, I'm going to illustrate this by talking about some of the training that I do. In fact, if you watch my other segments, uh, I do go deeper into this. So one of the things I, I do in the, in the workshops I teach is teaching the four communication styles. Uh, 
D-I-S-E, starting in the upper left, going clockwise around. You'll see D, dominance, I, influence, S, steadiness, C, conscientiousness. So in my training with engineers, I want to show engineers that there are other communication styles and that we need to be particularly aware of and adapt our style to the style in the diagonal opposite corner. So recognize your blind spot and be receptive to flexing your style. Now, in the training, I explain that, and I do it as follows. I say, well, a lot of engineers are the Cs, the conscientiousness type of speakers, uh, uh, communicators. They we love facts and details. We care about accuracy. And they diagonal opposite communication style is somebody like Robin Williams. So Bill Gates versus Robin Williams, completely different communication styles. Bill Gates is quiet, uh, he's uh, steady, uh, he's deliberate. Robin Williams, God rest his soul, was, you know, all over the map, fun, crazy, possibilities, loves applause. So I could leave the training at that and say, hey, engineers, you need to deliver content in a more fun way. So I, I make that point, but then I illustrate it, I add to it, by telling the story about, here we go, once upon a time. So when, And here's how it goes. When I was 11 years old, I tell my dad was an engineer, grew up in San Francisco. He was very precise and detail-oriented. One day when I was 11, he took me to the backyard and said, Raj, you are now becoming a man, and you're going to have a job at the house, and it's going to be watering the backyard. Now, San Francisco backyards down the peninsula near the airport were not very big. So we could, you know, uh, now there's water rationing and fires. But back in the day, we could water our backyard. So now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to divide the lawn into nine squares, like a giant piece of graph paper was laid on top of it. And I want you to spend 1.5 minutes on each square, back and forth. I want you to do that back and forth. I'm going to give you a watch to follow. And then you're going to move to, to the second square. And I said, great, 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 great. Uh, and then as soon as my dad left, I'm now I'm more like Robin Williams. I pretended I was a firefighter and had, had jumped out of an airplane and landed, and I got my, uh, you know, hose connected to the water tank they had on the ground. And I'm, I'm wildly, you know, with a hose flailing all over, uh, putting the lawn out like a crazy man. So I say that, tell that story to illustrate the difference between engineers and salespeople, to help engineers, in this case, understand salespeople. Again, I could have just given the facts, but if I give facts plus the story, it helps illustrate the point. So you might use these types of stories to clarify a point, uh, give an example, reduce resistance. Maybe you want to motivate somebody to learn. Okay, Many ways to use the illustration point. Uh, how about a story about uh, to influence other people? Again, we're talking about types of stories and where to use them. Well, I want to influence somebody to, to do something, and here's a story. My objective in my workshops that I teach, this particular point, is to teach people that we need to understand other people's point of view, much like helping engineers understand what it's like to be a salesperson, different communication style, different needs, uh, that kind of thing. So I illustrate it by telling a story about my backyard. And I'll, I'll give you the short version, but essentially it is about 15 years ago, again, notice at the beginning, time and place, time, place. About 15 years ago, I had to fly to Chicago. I got up early at 4 a.m., and to get to my car, I had to walk through the backyard from my house to the, the barn, the garage that you see back there. And I would walk directly in the path that you're seeing. Well, at 4 a.m., it was kind of misty out. It had been raining overnight. Uh, the moon uh, was about a half moon, and there was kind of a purple sky. And uh, you know how you walk? How, if something changes in your normal routine, it stands out, maybe a neighbor painted their house a different color, and boom, it, it pops out at you when you're driving by. Well, that th same thing happened to me. I, was, I passed the tree on the right, I passed the tree on the left, and I was rounding the corner to enter the garage. 
there was somebody standing there, and I completely freaked out because we live in a remote area. Our yard is fenced in, and I thought I was going to get killed. So I screamed and yelled. And nobody came. And this was back in the day of flip phones. I flipped open my phone. And I said, hold it right there. This thing wasn't moving, and I thought, eh, maybe, uh, maybe I'm seeing something. I stepped a little bit closer, a little bit closer, and as it turns out, it was a woman soaking wet, shivering. She, as it turns out, she had uh, been in a domestic situation several blocks away, had run away, and found safety in my backyard. And so in that split second, when I saw the world through her eyes instead of mine, I realized she was a victim and not me. All right, again, that's a way to illustrate the point. And you'll notice how all of these stories so far, they've had nothing to do with business. They are from my personal life, but they have direct relevance to making a business point. In this case, to be better communicators, we need to first think about the other person's point of view. Okay, here's another example. Now, this is from business. I was teaching a group of uh, uh, petrochemical engineers, uh, uh, how to do, how to do, how to train other people about their technical content. And so this is literally that slide. The engineer came to the workshop saying, "Hey, what do you think of this?" Uh, and, and actually, it was this is just one paragraph. It was actually four of these in more fine font. And maybe you re some of you relate to this. I do see a lot of engineers putting the entire script up on the screen. We we want to move away from that, and I think I did a presentation on presentation skills and give, give some tips on that there. Anyway, this is just one, uh, two sentences from, from that presentation. Essentially, he's saying, hey, uh, there's, there are dangerous gases in petrochemical plants, and if they leak into the air uh, and one little spark gets into the atmosphere, boom, we got a problem. And so I said, look, there are a couple of ways we could improve that. Again, instead of just giving the description like he's done here, how about put a picture up that shows the dramatic impact of what happens? And I said, how about better yet, why don't we tell the story about Bob, who was in the plant when this happened, and how he's now covered, you know, 30% in burns and tell Bob's story. So you could show the picture, tell people what you need to do, but then much like I did with the watering the lawn story, reinforce, in this case, influence the other person to motivate them to really make that safety change, to put those safety measures in place. Let's, let's make it human and tell the story about Bob. You'll see uh, if a political leaders all over the world do this when they're speaking. I, my point of reference here is the United States, but you'll, when the president, whoever they've been over the last many years, when they're giving the State of the Union, the annual uh, speech to uh, the, 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 you know, the heads of government here, uh, hey, here's how we're doing and so forth, they will m almost always tell stories. In fact, what they do is they have the person they're telling the story about in the audience, how Julie was the first helicopter pilot and how she lost her legs in the war, and there she's Julie, and she came from a, you know, a poor background and from Tennessee and so forth. So they humanize things through telling stories about people. Uh, okay, here's a format for talking about our next category, which is improve. So we've talked about influence, uh, we've talked about inform. Let's talk now about improve, which is where you want to tell a story about where you've been successful. Now, you might use this in a job interview, or you're looking to get a promotion, or you're working with somebody to get funding for a project. Uh, you want to tell stories to show how you've been successful. Again, not just giving the facts about what you did before, but giving the facts and illustrating that through a story. So here's an example that we used earlier, uh, the Gartner, you know, when I started Gartner sales training and, and all that. Uh, the objective was a track record of success. 
and then I can get results. Here's the, here's the process, CAR, C-A-R, challenge, action, result. So what was the challenge you faced? Again, now think about a situation you're in where you want to persuade somebody on hiring you or approving your project, funding your project. You want to show, give a case study on where you've been successful. This is a great formula. Talk about what the challenge was what action you took to overcome that challenge, and what was the result, what was the payoff or value, C-A-R. Okay, here's another story about how, uh, how that might sound. All right, so I, I've got three children. Uh, I've got one, my youngest child is, is, a, is a boy. Uh, I was a big boy scouter. My dad was, is an Eagle Scout. I'm an Eagle Scout. So I wanted to at least introduce my son to Boy Scouts. I had a lot of fun doing that, uh, learning values, uh, the great outdoors, camaraderie with other people, good people. And uh, so I said, hey, they, so my son decided to join the troop. And uh, after a couple of years, they asked me if I would be a leader. I said, sure. And they said, great, we want you to be the uh, committee chair. And that's uh, different than a scout master, but uh, whatever. This is more on the uh, the, the management side. So, so I said, we didn't have a lot of scouts in the troop at the time. In fact, we had about uh, 18. And uh, so I said, hey, we need to grow the troop a little bit. So, so here's the challenge. The troop uh, would fold, would, would, would close if we didn't get some, some more business, if we didn't get some more uh, scouts interested in the, in the troop. So what we did was I sat down with a couple of the leaders. This is the action. So the challenge was the group, troop's going to fold if we don't get busy uh, getting some new people in, having good times. The action was, so I took a look with some other people at what our core strength was, which was the great outdoors. We do a lot of backpacking. In fact, our troop goes out west to Yosemite, Yellowstone, Rocky Mountain National Park for these 80-mile backpack trips every summer. So I said that's our core strength. That's our brand. So we put together a plan to, to let other boys know that, you know, the other side of Boy Scouts, it's not just tying knots, it's going on awesome trips. So we put together a show where we would invite the kids in with their parents. We'd give them a slideshow. We'd have the boys uh, – uh, you know, our current scouts do the talking so that the moms would say, oh, my son could be like this. And, and then the parents were there saying, oh, my gosh, I'd love to go on these backpack trips. So long story short, the action was put together a program where they could see the pictures, have our scouts tell the story because they're relatable. And then thirdly, we have them go outside on the lawn and actually use the equipment. We'd have different stations with the stoves, setting up a tent, trying out the food, so give them a hands-on experience. Well, we went from 18 to 60, so we more than tripled the size of the troop. Uh, we had so many people going on these backpack trips, we had to get a second bus in the locations. So that was the result. Challenge, troops going to fold, action, slides, hands-on activities, result, triple the size. Okay. So imagine, this is probably one of the most important things you can use uh, in this presentation. A, tell stories. B, use this formula when you are asked in an interview or when you're presenting to be uh, influential or persuasive. Use the challenge action result uh, steps. Okay? All right. Again, use this is a great way to, to package a case study, uh, job interviews, any influencing situation. All right, and then finally, let's look at the final category here. This is our screen loads. It's, I think I've, this happened once before. Let's go to, there we go. All right. Uh, I think I mentioned the yellow cake story uh, just uh, a few minutes ago. Um, so I actually do use this. I'm starting to use it now in my talks, actually, I, as I mentioned, just use it a few minutes ago. Uh, the objective is to, uh, and I do this eh, maybe not always for a business audience, but for other audiences I speak to. We, the objective is to get people to be kind, help other, and good, do good deeds. 
So I tell the yellow cake story, which I told earlier. My mom actually met this woman who was down on her luck outside the grocery store asking for free food. And my mom took her into the store uh, because the woman said, oh, I've got this great yellow cake story uh, recipe. And my mom said, you know what, let's do it right now. Boom, 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 you know the rest of the story. Um, And that was so out of character for my mom because she was like never talk to strangers, uh, never invite somebody you don't know into your house. And she broke all the rules to, uh, to help this woman out, which stuck with me now many years later. So you might use a story to inspire with employees if you manage people or even coworkers on uh, we've got to be kinder to each other in the office. Maybe you've got your own, quote, yellow cake story. Uh, maybe it's a story with customers, peer groups. So a story to inspire is never a bad thing. So let's look at, as we wrap up this second section on what is a story, we've talked about the five story types. Here is the structure of a story. I talked earlier about the hero's journey. I do a lot of creative writing, and um, this, is the, this, is, this is the structure of novels, of movies. Maybe you've seen this before. It, it's from Joseph Campbell. Uh, book he wrote, gosh, many, many years ago. And here's a simplified version of that. So a story starts over on the left, once upon a time, San Francisco, father and engineer. So a setting and characters. And then there's a call to action. That's really the challenge. Hey, the Boy Scout troop was going to go out of business. Uh, My career was, my acting career was derailed. Maybe you were unemployed. Maybe a boss said, hey, Steve, Julie, Stephanie, you need to pick it up here and take on some more responsibility. So there's a call to action, a point at which you've got to do something. And then you you start climbing the mountain, and uh, you you reach, you have obstacles, challenges that you've got to overcome. Think of your favorite movies. You know, they don't all uh, start out happy and then end up, and everything goes perfectly. No. Things get... Things are thrown in their way. The hero has got to overcome challenges. So as you're telling your case study, your success story, describe the challenges you faced and what you did to overcome them. Well, ultimately, you you slay the dragon. You uh, get the girl. You put the fire out. uh, You get a better job. You're successful. And you describe in your storytelling what the result was. That's the R in car. Uh, the challenge, the action, the result, what uh, action you got. And then as stories go, there's resolution and a new normal where people live happily ever after. Yeah, I just wanted to give you that framework. Uh, I just think it's important to know it in in storytelling, and maybe you've been exposed to that before. Uh, Another key point is you want to tailor your stories. We talked earlier about we've all been around people who are boring storytellers, Uh, So we don't want to do that ourselves. So just a quick reminder that there are these four communication styles, and you want to tell the story differently, modify it, for each of the four styles. So we've got uh, the Ds, the dominant folks. They want things told in bullet points. They want things to be efficient. So you're going to tell your story very fast to these people. Uh, Hey, we had a problem. Uh, We did three things, one, two, three. Problem was fixed, and sales went up 20%. Customer satisfaction went up 20%. That's all they want, short and sweet. The influencers, the Robin Williams, they want to hear the fun. Oh, my gosh, our company was going to go out of business. The boss said, hey, you got to put do something creative with marketing. Uh, we did a wild brainstorm session. We went off-site. We went out to dinner, and we, we thought of the craziest ideas. And the best three ideas were one, two, three, and we we had this such this such a feeling of teamwork and inspiration. Everybody jumped on board. We got it done. We saved the company, and and not only did we save it, but sales went up twenty percent. Okay, in the lower right, the steadiness folks. These people love relationships. They care about people and harmony. So as you're telling that same story, you want to emphasize. You want to tell it a little bit slower, a little bit kinder, a little more gentle. These people love harmony. They don't want, they don't want things pushed at them aggressively. 
So we want to talk about, gosh, we were all so down. Uh, people were getting laid off. Uh, we were about to go out of business. And uh, I'll never forget how the CEO uh, stopped taking his income and said, why don't we go off-site for a day? Let's, let's, let's just really think creatively how we can work as a team to come together to save, save this place. So emphasizing teamwork, harmony, people. Okay, how would you tell the same story about saving the company to a Bill Gates, to an engineer? You would, you would present the situation. The company was about to go out of business. Give some facts, some data, some statistics. We went down 20% each year over the last five years. And give more details about that. And then we, we did the off-site brainstorming meeting. We had a very structured approach to how to do that. We broke into small groups of three. Each team of three came back with five ideas. We voted, blah, blah, blah. You see, they want the details, the itinerary, how it came together. So you've got to, you've got to tailor your approach to each of those different audiences, especially, another key point, if you're a detailed person like Bill Gates, you want to make sure you are able to stretch yourself, tell that story in a lively, fun, entertaining way. Just pump up your energy. Don't be so linear. Don't get bogged down in the facts. Make it fun and exciting as though you are channeling your inner Robin Williams. All righty. There we go. All right. So we've talked about why stories. We've talked about story types, the five types, and the structure of a story and how important it is to tailor your story. And by the way, I would recommend practice telling your story. Uh, just tell it as though you were telling friends at a barbecue in your backyard. Uh, don't get too hung, on, hung up on structure and whatnot. Just, just practice telling people and pay attention to where they're really engaged and to where they're uh, falling asleep. All right, let's talk about how. How do we do this? Well, first of all, we got to find the story. And I'll tell you, stories are everywhere. You probably have stories you've told to your friends, to your colleagues. Start paying attention to those and write them down. Write down the, name, the type of the story, maybe a couple key points. Uh, maybe you've had uh, uh, mentors in the past who have inspired you, uh, bosses, the way they've conducted themselves. You can tell the story about them. Uh, maybe in your background there was a teacher, a professor, a teacher in school or a professor in college who taught you something, uh, who motivated you, who showed you the way. Wow, you can tell the story about how they did that to you. All right? So you can start with the story over on the right or start with the point you want to make. Now you're thinking about your presentation, uh, and you're going to think, you know, are there any stories – I have that might fit here, or the other way, what are the key points I'm trying to make, and gosh, what are the stories I have that might tie into this? So if you've been keeping a journal, keeping a list of stories, uh, and you know the key points, you could look at your list of stories and say, oh, the backyard story would fit, for, fit perfectly there. But let's, let's take a look at how you might think about finding a story when you already know the point. So you want to ask questions as you're preparing your presentation or your job interview or your small business uh, uh, roundtable meeting, whatever, whatever it is. You want to ask questions. All right, who's the audience? Uh, what do they do? Where do they live? What do they like? What are their fears and desires? And you're certainly going to think about what the objectives are for your, your presentation. We're trying to get funding for a project or what have, what have you. Okay, that's, that's assumed. So then you want to say, all right, so in my case, you are the audience. I thought, all right, who's the audience? Well, they're engineers. Oh, my father's an engineer. What do they do? Well, they're computer people. Oh, I've worked with computer people. Where do they live? Well, probably all over, so they're not going to relate to a specific place, but mm, everybody kind of knows San Francisco. What are they like? Well, they're probably introverted. Uh, they're probably more like Bill Gates and Robin Williams fears and desires, it may not love public speaking, all right, so maybe through learning how to tell stories, they can be, feel more comfortable telling, uh, giving presentations. So my answer is they're engineers, live all the world, there we go, uh, I'd love to invent things. Again, I'm brainstorming a list, maybe these aren't all true, 
And then out of that, I'm thinking, all right, so given all the, these things I've discovered about you in this case, what stories might I have? Oh, father's an engineer. Let's bring in the telephone pole piece. Uh, let's talk about the Gartner experts, because you, being computer engineers, computer pros, are just like the Gartner experts. So that, that might be, uh, that, that's how I worked on this presentation. And that's a format for helping you think through how am I going to find stories. I do, when I teach this in workshops, I do hear from engineers, I don't have any stories at all. Absolutely you do. There's probably something that went wrong at work one time. Okay, what was the problem, the challenge? What action did you take? What was the result? Stories happen every day. As I said, uh, yellow cake story right before this call, the prom story I told about my friend in the speaker's group, boom, just last Saturday. Or you can start with your story. Keep a list of all your stories. Uh, let's take my backyard story, for example. Here's, here's the process I went through thinking about what are the key points. Uh, okay, number one, uh, I really thought I might die. Uh, then I was thinking about afterwards what's truly important. You know, here I was worried somebody's trespassing in my yard, going to do wrong, when this poor woman uh, was in a really desperate situation. So what's truly important? Family friends, relationships. Uh, nobody listens. I screamed for help. Nobody listened. Uh, things aren't always what they appear. Again, I'm brainstorming points that I might make with the same story. Uh, get the facts before judging. That could have been the point. Um, the woman was scared. Uh, maybe it's another yellow cake-like story. Uh, you've got to show empathy. Um, talk about what life was like for her. Uh, you know, show how we may have it easier than other people. Uh, boom, and then I, I settled on see the other person's point of view. But let's say I'm giving five talks on different topics. I could give this. I could tell the same story, and use a different point for the same story. But it is absolutely important that you um, do have points for your story. Um, so we don't want to just. So I think I've got some do's and don'ts in a second. Um, so I keep track of my stories the old-fashioned way. I keep, I've got a hundred of these little notebooks. I've got a lifetime supply, and I just write things down. Uh, maybe you want to put them on your smartphone, but I would encourage you to, to right after this call, make a list of the five stories uh, that pop to mind or you've told a lot at, with friends, and just make note of them, and then start thinking about how you could apply them to, to your own life. Some do's and don'ts. Let's wrap this this fun fest up and go to questions and be thinking about those. You can start typing those in. And uh, some, do, some do's. Be creative and don't hesitate to use personal stories. Use some work stories, but you'll see, as I mentioned earlier, most of my, 90% of my stories here were personal that I brought in for business or presentation skills uh, applications. And practice. Practice telling your stories. Uh, the idea here is to not to go super long. Uh, just make the story long enough to make to tell the key point, to make the key point. Uh, don't we don't don't ever steal a story. So, for example, if you were to say, you know, say "Oh, I love Roger's uh, yellow cake story," I'm going to go tell that to my next group. No, that's uh, that ain't cool. Uh, it's inauthentic. It it won't ring true, and it's you know it's not the right thing to do. So. We want to use your own stories. Now, telling the story about how a boss helped you or inspired you or the way he did business, that's fine. Uh, so, but we don't want to just take somebody else's story and tell it because that will eventually backfire on you. Um, to two, we don't want to make stories up, okay? Uh, you can tighten stories up, leave out some of the details to make it short, tight, and impactful. Uh, but don't, don't just make up stories. Uh, and then we don't want to be the hero of our own story. So we don't like people who brag. Um, but there are nice ways to show your success uh, without, uh, you know, making yourself the big shot. Now, I will say the exception to that is in a job interview, 
Uh, absolutely. You've got to put yourself in the best light. You, you, in that case, you do want to be the hero of the story. Uh, there are just ways of doing it where you don't come across as a um, uh, arrogant, you know, kind of an unfriendly person. I think you know what I mean. Okay? Make sure the story has a point and that it's ultimately about them. So here's another formula you can use. Point story application. So when you're giving presentations or uh, you know, big ones or small ones, um, make sure each story you tell has, includes the point and the application. Uh, you don't necessarily have to present them in that way. Uh, you could tell the story first, then tell people what the point is, and then tell people how this is relevant to them. So let's take the story of me walking through the backyard. Uh, I'm going to tell the point of the story first. Hey, folks, when we're communicating with other people and we want to influence them, we first need to understand their point of view. We need to know what the world look, looks like from their point of view. Uh, let me tell you a quick story about, about uh, a time I learned this in my own life. About 15 years ago, boom, 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 I tell the story. And I say, uh, so we really, in that moment, I learned that uh, it, it's important to, in that, in that moment, I saw what the world looked like from the other person's, from that woman's point of view, and it made a huge difference. Now the application, I'll say something like, so folks, as engineers, when we're talking to people who are not like us, they're more energetic, uh, they're, they're short attention spans, what we really need to do is understand that they need to hear things in a different way. So we need to change the way we communicate with them, change the way we tell them stories. Okay, so that's the PSA uh, format. I, I touched on this early on. Ultimately, the most important story is the other person's story. If you want to make a friend and be more influential, get to know the other person. Get them telling their story. Uh, when we're interested in them, they will think we're interest, interesting. So interested is interesting. Uh, this is from the movie Loser. Uh, it's a line, this Dan Aykroyd, an actor way back from the original Saturday Night Live uh, show, if you remember, if you're familiar with that program, he was in the first, uh, the first season, first, first cast member. Uh, he was later in a movie where he's dropping his son off at college at New York University. He and his dad are in the dorm room. His son is scared. He's nervous. He says, Dad, how am I going to make any friends? And Dan Aykroyd says, Son, the secret to making friends, I learned this when I was in the Army. Here's the key. Interested is interesting. Let people tell their story. Let them talk. Hear their story. If you do that, you'll have no problem making friends. So ultimately, by telling a story, we want to help the other person make their story, make their dream come true, to achieve their objective, to overcome the hurdles. So I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn. I, there I am, Roger Granis. Type me in. Let's connect. Would love to continue the dialogue. I mentioned freebies. Uh, I love offering 30-minute consultations. If you want to schedule a half hour with me to talk about storytelling or practice a story or ask a question about stories, what have you, or communications, Send me an email, IEEE free consultation. Uh, uh, that is for the first five people. And uh, gosh, we'd love, love to help you out. All righty. And again, let's okay. connect on LinkedIn. And I hear the lines opening. There we go. Thank you. Uh, hi, Roger. Um, so besides uh, uh, providing our listeners with uh, your slides, uh, um, one of our um, uh, listeners wondering if uh, um, do you have any other relevant materials that are publicly or for uh, purchase? Oh, uh, uh, in addition to the slides, I, yes. I, I am working on a book on uh, effective presentations. It is not available yet. Um, I tell you what, if you send me an email, I have them send me an email. I'll go, Roger, right at the top there. Um, I do 
have an article or two uh, that I can send you. They're also on my website, granisgroup.com, under, I think it's under articles, which you can download there. But again, send me an email, and I'm happy to send those, uh, email those to you directly. Great. Um, we have time for a few more questions. So here's another one. Um, how would you work to adapt the storytelling approach to different cultural groups, international audience with different cultural um, touchstones? Would, would, uh, would those changes risk losing uh, um, credibility? That is a great question, really good one. Uh, certainly we want to be super sensitive to the other cultures, and I would um, filter your stories to find ones that, are, that have universal appeal. So, so stories about family, uh, stories about, uh, a, a, that take place in a location that everyone might know, uh, those uh, are, I think, are all super safe. Um, but we don't. But right, we, we don't want to offend. Uh, we don't want to tell stories where there's any hint of uh, of anything that's going to not be appropriate for that that audience. I, I would say, as I think through my stories today, um, they're probably all pretty okay. I would probably test out, test out meaning I would ask some people in that culture about the backyard story. Is there anything in there with the woman uh, being in the yard uh, who had a domestic dispute? Uh, I would want to make sure that would be, be safe. But I think certainly something like a yellow cake story or going to a high school dance those are universal experiences that I think everyone relates to and would not cause any, uh, any, any conflict, but definitely test them out. Uh, test meaning ask somebody. So if you're telling a story, even in the United States, ask somebody in human resources, hey, I want to just see how, uh, if these are okay, or ask the host, uh, whoever that is. Uh, yeah, for sure. Great. Um, here's another question. Uh, do stories have to be related to the technical materials in a presentation? It may be hard to come up with such stories. Okay, so is, uh, the, the, what's the question? Does the story have to be related to the technical issue? Yes. It says, uh, do stories have to be related to the technical materials in a presentation? No, they don't. They don't. The, the, the most important thing, though, is that the point of the story has got to relate to the problem you're trying to solve or the point you're trying to make. Um, and yeah, so as you see, I mean, I brought in personal stories that had nothing to do with engineering, but the points had everything to do with the points I'm trying to make here. Um, yeah, and I take the example of the the friend who is, uh, you know, the person in this speakers association who wanted, who had already hired a speaker, and I said, I think we need somebody else, and he told the story about his high school dance, his prom, as we call it here, and I thought, Matt, you just did it. You illustrated the point with a perfect story, so no. The, the stories do not have to do with the technical material. Make sure the point it, it, it does. In fact, a story that's unrelated to the technical aspect is sometimes better because it, it pulls the audience out of that technical material and helps see, uh, see the point you're trying to make in, in something that's a little bit easier to, to grasp, perhaps. Great. Uh, we have time for one more question. Um, if I have a story, if I have a true story, can I add some fictional details for humor or add to the objective? So if I have a, a story that's true, can I add yes. fictional pieces? Uh, right, fictional details um, to, for, to add humor. Yeah. For uh, humor. I, I tend to stay with the truth, um, but you want to tell the truth uh, effectively. So I cut out all the dull parts. I have been to storytelling workshops 
I hang out with speakers and we tell stories. And they, uh, the speakers, have an old saying, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. So I would, my bias is to stick to the truth uh, but but tell it effectively. So I, I just prefer uh, if somebody comes to me after I tell a story and say, "Hey, God, it was great. I, did that really happen?" I want to be able to say, "Absolutely, yes." It just like that. I mean, change a detail, okay, maybe. Um, but I, I lean toward telling that, keeping the facts basically. Oh, you know what? Let me give you an example. Now, boom. See here, I'm going into a story. So one of my all-time favorite speakers is Mark Scherenbrock. If you want to check him out, go to nice, N-I-C-E, bike, B-I-K-E, dot com. His May, his signature story, as we call it, is, is when he went to, uh, he happened to be driving in a rental car when Harley Davidson was having their 100-year anniversary, and suddenly he was surrounded by these uh, motorcyclists and he was in a rental car. Now, he was in, uh, I don't know what kind of rental car he was actually in, but he, in the story, tells it it was a beige-colored Ford Taurus, which is a very boring car. So he changed the name and type of the car to sound more boring. To me, that's perfectly fine. Um, but to make up that he was at, surrounded by motorcycles and all that, Hey, I don't know if you want to do that. So, anyway, I'm rambling. I would stick to the facts, change a couple of details if it helps you be more funny and uh, more engaging. Perfect. Great, great. Thank you, Roger, for this informative presentation, and thank you, everyone, for participating. Uh, we have additional free webinars coming up in October. The next webinar in the lecture series will be held on the 8th October at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time on the the Rise of the Quantum Internet, presented by Marcelo Califi, Associate Professor at the University of Naples, uh, Federico. The next uh, Build Your Career webinar series will be held on the 21st of October at 11 a.m. Eastern Time on uh, Writing Confidence, uh, Effective Emails by Elsa Velasco-Paul, co-founder of the m &E Group. Registrations for these upcoming events are now open. Again, we will be sending you a link to these future events along with the slides and recordings of this webinar. Thank you again, everyone, and have a great day.